What we're doing is looking at activities or things that God has, has given to his people to encourage us and to strengthen us and to, to help us grow to be more like Jesus, to help us uh, to care for one another and, uh, and, as I say, to grow in our faith. And we've looked at things like uh, the Bible, how God gave us the Bible to encourage us, how God's given us prayer, how God's given us worship, how God's given us all sorts of different things to help us grow. And today we are looking at the habit of fellowship, the habit of of fellowship. Now, uh, fellowship, I wonder what you think of when I say that word. Uh, it isn't a word that we use very often today. It's sometimes used of um, awards or grants. So like a university can give a fellowship, uh, perhaps a bit like a scholarship. Um, uh, when I became a Christian uh, a few years ago now, 30 something years ago, uh, it was used instead of the word church. And uh, so rather than being called uh, the Honiton Community Church, then we might have been called the Honiton Christian Fellowship. And uh, there are still a few churches around who call themselves a fellowship. The songbook that we used, I don't know if you remember this, was called Songs of Fellowship. Who remembers that? Yeah. A few of us do. Uh, and I'm not sure it's a word I would use today. I think unchurched people probably aren't very familiar, I'm not sure church people are very familiar uh, with it, although actually it's not a bad word uh, to replace the word church, because it means to share, it means a shared life. Uh, the word in the New Testament, the Greek word is the word koinonia, uh, which means to have things in common, and uh, we share things. So it's used in the Bible of a shared meal. So the word that is translated uh, communion is actually the word fellowship. It's the same, same word in uh, 1 Corinthians 10. <clears throat> in Romans 12, they take part, the church takes part in an offering uh, for the poor. And they do this together. It's something they share in. And so the word fellowship there is translated sharing in an offering, but it's this same word. <coughs> So it means to share, it means a shared life. It describes the relationship that people have together when they have things in common, when they share the same purpose and the same values. And it's, it's an intimate relationship, perhaps uh, like a band of brothers or, or like a sisterhood. It's a sense of we're in this together. We're close friends. We're not just, it's not a business relationship. We're close friends, but we've got a purpose uh, as well. Perhaps a well-known use uh, of it that people might have heard of uh, is in the title of the first book. Uh, and if you bring up the next slide, William, the title of uh, the first book of the Lord of the Rings uh, trilogy, and obviously therefore the first movie, uh, The Fellowship of the Ring. And a group of people travelling together to, to get rid of a ring. Can't be that hard, sure. Uh, but they, um, uh, and they became obviously very close friends on the journey. They are a fellowship. So let's turn to the Bible and see what the, how the Bible uses the word fellowship. So turn firstly to 1 John and chapter 1. The text will come up on the screen. 1 John chapter 1. <coughs> and I'm going to read uh, from the NIV. 1 John chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared. We have seen it and testify to it. And we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, <clears throat> so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. 
And then if you turn to Acts and chapter 2, Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, Acts 2 verse 42, <coughs> we read, this is a story of the early church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. That word there, translated in common, is the same root word as the word fellowship. They, all the believers were together. They had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Father, we just pray as we look at your word uh, that you would speak to us. And uh, Lord, help us to understand this word fellowship. Understand what we have together. Understand what we have with you. Lord, we thank you. You've drawn us together into a wonderful church community. And so, Lord, we pray, would you help us to be all that you've called us to be? Lord, a model of what it looks like for people to live together in harmony and under God. So be with us. Speak to us, we pray this morning. Amen. So both of these passages, as I say, use the word fellowship, and they describe, firstly, the relationship that we have with God, and then secondly, the relationship we have, or at least the relationship we should have with one another. So firstly, uh, this passage in John says, it uses the word fellowship to describe the relationship we have with God. 1 John 1 verse 3, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Then verse 6 says, we have fellowship with him, that is fellowship with God. And it's interesting that John uses this word because it's a, it's a quite different word from the kind of legal language that the Apostle Paul often uses to explain the gospel. So when Paul is explaining the gospel, he often uses, as I say, very legal language. God is a judge. Uh, we are, uh, there is a law that we have broken. We are guilty of sin. And then, amazingly, we are justified. We are made righteous. But the language that Paul uses is very legal kind of language. And the danger with that kind of language is, especially if we ignore other biblical language, <clears throat> that we think of our relationship with God as rather formal. It's a solemn relationship. Now, there's nothing wrong with that language, that legal language. But if we only look at that kind of language, we could end up with this idea, well, God's a judge. He's declared me to be not guilty, but, but actually I still feel like I need to keep my distance. But in saying we have fellowship with God, then John is, is highlighting a different way of thinking about the gospel. A different way of expressing the same kind of truths, because what John is saying is we have now been united with God. We've been joined to God. We're in community with God. We are in a fellowship with God. A close, intimate relationship. A family relationship. It's close. It's not distant and remote. Perhaps this is what um, Peter meant when he said we participate in the divine nature. There's a sense in we've been joined to God. If we are going to use the language of Paul, perhaps the language Paul uses is the language of adoption, being brought into a family. And so when we become Christians, we're not simply uh, believing some truths and then attending a church. That's not what's happening. When we become Christians, we have been joined to God in deep and profound ways. The moment we believe, we have fellowship with God. We have things in common with God. We are close to God. As I say, it's the difference between <clears throat> being in business together and being family together. And John, in his letter, makes a lot, a bit later on, about we're children of God. We're his children. Perhaps it's an appropriate thing to celebrate on a, on a Father's Day. 
And actually, it's a much deeper relationship than simply we're in business with God. No, no, we're his children. We're close. We're family. It's an intimate relationship. We have fellowship with God. And that's what happened when you became a Christian. I wonder what your relationship with God is like. Is your relationship with God distant? Is it a bit formal? Or is it a father and a child? Is it, is it close? We have fellowship with God. That's the first thing that this, these passages use this word fellowship for, our relationship with God. But then, <clears throat> John doesn't say simply that we've been joined to God as individuals, which is true. But then what he says is that each of us being joined to God is what we have in common. So we have been joined to God. So what he says is, uh, he says, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son. And then he says, and you have fellowship with us. See, we are, are joined to God, but not simply, right, each of us have a personal relationship with God. You sometimes hear that kind of language. That's true, but actually the way the Bible describes it is not just me and my personal relationship with God, but together. We are in fellowship with God. Together, we are in community with God. We have this in common. We share our relationship with God. Verse 3, you have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with God. And so we're in community with one another. That's what happens when you become a Christian. You're joined to each other, but then in being joined to each other, we're also in community with God. And if there's one thing that defines the Christian life, it should be community. Now, <clears throat> obviously our Western world loves independence. It loves freedom. And it's becoming increasingly fragmented. And so whereas years ago, what was valued was community. What was valued, what was important years ago was my, my role within society, my duty towards others. That was what was valued years ago. But now, what is valued is the individual. The right of the individual. The freedom of the individual. I'm, I'm free to, to think what I like. I'm free to be what I like. To do whatever I like. I'm, I'm autonomous. I'm independent. And the danger is that when we become Christians, we bring these kind of attitudes into the church. Well, I'm still free to think what I like. I'm still free to believe what I like and, and do what I like and live how I like and come and go when I like. And that is not the language of the Bible. Rather, we have fellowship together and our fellowship is with God. Let me give you an illustration. <clears throat> so if you could put up the next photo, uh, the next one after that. Here we are. Okay. That is our herb garden. I realize it's not much of a garden. Uh, that's our limit, actually. Um, <clears throat> well, not quite. And obviously the plants at the front are struggling. But, <laughs> so, it's a, what do we call it? Tub. It's more, it's more of a map made, actually. It's more of a tub than a trough. Thank you, that's a good word for it. So herb garden might be stretching it. But, anyway, that's not my point. So, my point is, each of those plants, they share the soil, but basically it's every plant for itself. So each plant, yeah, they're in the soil together, but really, if, you, if, if, if one plant might thrive, one plant might struggle, it's like, as long as I'm doing fine, I couldn't care about, well, I was going to say about the mint, but mint will always, <laughs> will always do fine, because it'll take over, but everything. But other things, you think, it, it's basically, they're, they're, yes, they're together, but they're not really, one might thrive and another might die. There's no sense, really, of being one. Now, let's go on to my next one. Okay, this is uh, one of our fruit trees. And before you get too impressed, it, it's nice. It's, it, we're training it as an espalier. Uh, it came from Ollie's nursery. I don't know if Ollie and Faye are here this morning. Uh, but it came from Ollie and Faye's nursery. Now, <clears throat> this is a much better illustration of our fellowship. This is a much better illustration of our togetherness. Because all... All the branches, they share the same stem, and they all share the same root, and they live or die together. There's a sense of, no, no, we're all in this together. It's not, well, every plant for itself. No, no, 
We're in this together. And actually, obviously, it's a very biblical illustration of the church. John 15 and verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Now, what happens, I think, when modern Christians read a verse like that or hear a verse like that, <clears throat> what we hear is, uh, I am the vine and you are a branch. I, yes, I am a branch. But we don't hear the same sentence. No, no, no. You are the branches together. And if one branch is struggling, then the whole plant is struggling. And there's this sense of fellowship, sense of togetherness. This is an illustration of the community that God is building. This is an illustration of fellowship. We're in this together. We've been joined together. Not just kind of, we're in close proximity to each other. No, no, we're joined. God has done this. He has joined us together. And so, as Christians, we don't merely attend the same church. It isn't simply our names are all on the same membership list. No, no. If you are a Christian, then God has joined us together as his people. I've had uh, the huge privilege of traveling a bit with the church and I've traveled to different parts of the world. And what's a remarkable thing is that you can meet Christians from a completely different part of the world. And yet there's a remarkable, a, a, a supernatural sense of unity, a supernatural sense of we're joined together. Even It's not simply, we know the same songs, or we're both a bit religious. It's not that. It's much deeper than that. God has joined us together, and that is what fellowship means. Fellowship means God has joined us to one another. <clears throat> Matthew Henry, in his commentary on these verses in, in 1 John, he says, There is a fellowship or communion that runs through the whole church of God. There may be some personal distinctions and peculiarities. There are definitely <laughs> some peculiarities in the church of God. I'm not going to look at anybody. <laughs> but, but he says, there are personal distinctions and peculiarities, but there is a communion belonging to all the saints, from the highest apostle to the lowest believer. As there is the same precious faith and there are the same precious promises dignifying and crowning that faith and the same precious blessings and glories enriching and filling out those promises. God has joined us together. That's what fellowship means. Even though we're different, even though naturally we might not choose to be together or might not naturally easily go together, but God has brought us together in a supernatural way. He writes, Paul writes to the uh, Ephesians, and he's speaking about Jews and Gentiles who, who naturally would not at all be together. The Jews and the Gentiles were very hostile often to each other. And Paul says this in Ephesians. He says, God has created one new humanity. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of of his household. We are in fellowship together. If you're a Christian, then we are in fellowship together. Oh, I don't really feel a part of it. I feel a bit excluded. It's not a feeling. It is something that God has done, not based on feelings. We have fellowship together, John says, and we have fellowship with God. However, this series is about creating habits, cultivating good habits. So what is the habit of fellowship? Well, that's why the other verse is important, because the other verse in Acts 2 reminds us that it isn't sim something, something that is simply true of us, but is something that we have to work at. Acts 2 and verse 42, <clears throat> they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They devoted themselves to it. Ah, oh, but Adrian, you've been saying it's true of us. I mean, we are a fellowship. Why do we have to work at it? Well, my response would be, how does it work in your marriage? How does it work in your family? How does it work in your friendship group? I mean, surely you still have to work at it. 
So Jenny and I have been married, you have to get this right by the way if you're going to quote numbers, we've been married for 32 years uh, this year. It's very simple because uh, we married in 1990 and Jenny said she chose that year so I could remember it easily, so very helpful. Um, <clears throat> so we've been married 32 years, but we still have to work at it. Now, would we be married if we didn't work at it? Probably. But, but just because something is true, something is said, legally true, that you still have to work at it to, to make sure it is fulfilled, to make sure it's a reality. And that's how friendships are, and that's how families are, and that's how marriages are, and that's what fellowship is. Yes, it's true. God has joined us together. But we have to work at it. We have to work at our togetherness so that our togetherness is the best togetherness it can be. Just say, oh, well, it's true. No, no, we want it to be great. We want a great togetherness. I like how the message uh, translation puts this verse. It says this. <clears throat> they committed themselves to the teaching of the apostles, to the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. I like that. They committed themselves to the life together. They weren't casual about it. They didn't just assume, well, it'll all be fine. No, no, they made sure it was fine because they devoted themselves to building community. They devoted themselves to the life together. And so, <clears throat> having said they devote themselves to fellowship, in the next few verses then, you see this being worked out. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to fellowship. And then verse 44, <clears throat> all the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number. Now, this was an unusual situation, so I'm not suggesting this is normal church life, that everyone has to uh, sell all their possessions. I think this is an unusual and unique situation. People have travelled from all over the Roman Empire to come to their city, like Jerusalem, to celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And then some of them have come to faith in Jesus, but they haven't got any income and they haven't got anywhere to live for any length of time and so how are they going to survive and so what they relied on was other brothers and sisters supporting them but obviously it's not a long-term solution it's a very short-term solution so as I say, I'm not suggesting uh, that communism is the biblical way I'm not suggesting that at all this is an unusual situation it's not a pattern for normal life but it does show the extent that they were prepared to go to in their fellowship to build community they're committed to this we're happy to share things and sometimes you share things and they don't come back the way you think, oh, Lend a paintbrush and it comes back rock hard. Oh. <coughs> Never sharing again. <laughs> no, we just need to share because we're in this together and God's our provider and we're, we're family. And, and so they worked at their fellowship. They worked at their fellowship. One of the words uh, that defines our vision, one of the three words, is community. Really. Community making disciples and engaged in mission, reaching out to other people with the gospel. And we want to celebrate our togetherness. We want to build a community. We don't just want to be functional, doing, making disciples, reaching out to people with the gospel. We do want to do those things. But as we do that, we want to be a fellowship, a community. They committed themselves to the life together. And being part of a community is, is quite different from being a churchgoer. It rules out things like church hopping. It rules out just occasional attendance. It rules out independent Christianity. We are committed to fellowship, to our shared life together. And so we cultivate good habits. We cultivate the habit of spending time together. We cultivate the habit of having meals together, the habit of caring for one another. And these things are habits. They're habits you can get out of. They're habits that you can get back into. Habits of worshipping together. 
the habit of praying together, the habit of sharing in the workload together, the habit of sharing in the financial responsibility together. These things are habits. You can get out of these habits, but you can get into these habits too. And if you're committed to the fellowship, then these things will be habits that you cultivate. Are these habits for you? This is our shared life together. This is fellowship. So fellowship is something that God has established, but it's also something that we have to work at. And so we cultivate habits to make sure that our fellowship is a reality. But finally, this series is called Habits of Grace. So how is fellowship a grace for you? How is it good for you? I guess some of that uh, is fairly obvious. Things like, and I've left the same image up there because food and drink are always good uh, for us to share. But God put us in community for encouragement, for support, for friendship when you're struggling, for companionship when you're lonely, for help when you're weak, and for having fun together. Uh, along the, the journey. And there are so many Bible verses that speak about community being good for us. That it's much better to be a part of a community than to live in isolation. Much better to be together with others than to live an independent life. The Bible says things like serve one another, love one another, honour one another, encourage one another, spur one another on. Offer hospitality to one another. And these things are good, both in the giving of these things and the receiving of these things. And of course, there are times when we need to do both. There are times when you need to be giving, and there are times when you need to be receiving. We were made to live in community. We were made to need one another. We were made for fellowship. And it's our pride that says, I'm fine on my own. I don't need anyone else. No, you do. And at some point in life, you will realize that you do. We all need one another. Sometimes it's hard, isn't it, to, to receive from others and to feel, I, I need looking after. But the reality is, we all do, at some point in life. We all do. So we want to be there for one another, caring for each other, receiving help, and, as I say, giving help. So, some aspects of family, uh, some aspects of fellowship are very obvious. Yeah, okay. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Family life. <laughs> it's fine. So, some aspects of, of being in fellowship are really obvious. Some benefits of being in, like looking, caring for one another, loving one another, and so on. Some aspects of fellowship, though, are not always so easy, but they are still good for us. And sometimes, community is hard and isolation is easier. Because sometimes, we want to be free to do what we want. And we don't want anyone challenging us. I'm uh, reminded, this probably says something about my age, but I'm reminded of the hermit in the life of Brian. I don't know if anyone remembers that. And um, <clears throat> he's living in isolation in a hole in the ground. And Brian comes along and falls in the hole and steps on his foot. And it's the first time he's spoken in years. And everyone's like, it's a miracle. And it's not a miracle. He stood on my foot. But anyway, uh, he wants to live on his own. He wants to be isolated because to some degree it's easier. No one challenges you when you live in isolation. No one steps on your toes. No one produces reactions in you, if it wasn't for everyone else. But they didn't produce that reaction in you. They just exposed it. And God wants to sometimes use one another to expose things in us, to reveal things in us that need changing. Because God has our ultimate good in mind. And so some aspects of fellowship are not always easy. And so although there are these wonderful love one another, care for one another, support one another kind of Bible verses, there are also harder things. Accept one another. Forgive one another. Don't grumble about one another. Admonish one another. 
Oh, no, I don't want that. I, I, I want people to look after me. I want people to bring meals around. I want that, but I don't, but I don't want anyone to admonish me. No, actually, God puts us in fellowship with one another, in community, for our good, for our growth, for our maturity, to make us mature, to make us more like Jesus, to make us more rounded, to make us, to make it easier to have friends, to make us easier to live with. God puts us in community for our good. Fellowship is good for us. It may not always feel that way. But fellowship is always good for us. So God has brought us into fellowship with himself. We are his children. So let me encourage you in a moment. We're going to go back to worship. Let me encourage you. Don't keep your distance from God. If you're here today and you're not a Christian, you can come into relationship with God by believing in Jesus. Just in a moment. And you can come into fellowship with God. Not just a distant, somber relationship, but a close father-child relationship. He loves you, and he wants us to walk closely with him. Let's not keep our distance. But then also, as he's brought us into fellowship with himself, he brings us into fellowship with one another. It is a reality, but we have to work at it to make it a reality too. Let's not take it for granted. Let's work together to make it a reality. So can I encourage you, make fellowship a habit. Make hospitality your habit. Is it your habit? I do it occasionally. No, make it a habit. Is sharing in the work that we do together, is that your habit? Is sharing in the financial responsibility your habit? Is worshipping and praying together your habit? God has joined us together for our good. It's not always easy, but it is good for us. Let's stand. And we're going to pray, and we're going to worship together. Thank you. Let's just take a moment and pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful relationship that you have brought us into with yourself. We do thank you that you have forgiven us our sins. We do thank you that you have taken away our guilt and justified us. But also, we thank you that you have adopted us into your family. We thank you that you call us your children. Father, we, we just pray, help us to, to enjoy your fatherhood and help us to enjoy the close relationship that we have with you help us to enjoy fellowship with God and father we thank you also for one another and how you've brought us into fellowship into community into friendship with each other so Lord we pray help us to cultivate the the habits of fellowship the habits of hospitality the habit of looking out for others, the habit of praying together. Help us to cultivate these habits, that our, our sense of fellowship, our sense of community won't just be uh, a word on a website or on a flyer, but it will be a reality, uh, Lord, in our lives and in this area. Lord, we want to build a church that is a community of people who love one another and love you. Lord, we thank you for the fellowship we have with you and the fellowship we have together. Help us to, to make it a reality, we pray.